Moving to the other side of the world is tough. We know this from our own experience of moving to Australia during a global pandemic. To help you decide whether a life down under is for you, this series aims to share with you the highs and the lows of the migration journey, hoping to help and inspire you to make the move yourself. If you're already thinking about moving to Australia or you're not sure where to start, then this episode is sponsored by True Blue Migration Services. Speak to them today and mention us and you will get a free visa assessment where they'll be able to tell you all of your options for moving to this beautiful country. Speak to them now on their website at True Blue migration.com. Our guest today moved to Australia after meeting the love of her life whilst on holiday, or if you're American, vacation. But things weren't that easy because soon after they met, COVID happened. What's it like leaving a long distance relationship all the way from America to Australia during a global pandemic? And what challenges face you when you want to be with your loved one trying to get a partnership visa, which is one of the most expensive visas you can get? I guess we're going to find out. G'day, Caitlin. How's it going? It's going well, Ross. How are you? I'm really good. I had to run back from work. I didn't run. I drove a vehicle. But I had to come back from work because I realized that we had booked our time in for this. And it has annoyed me because I've really realized that Australian roadworks are a thing and they're not much better than English roadworks. They're exactly the same. If anything, they overrun. They, they, they don't deliver on their promises of we'll be done by 3 p.m. Oh, it sounds exactly like American roadworks too. I guess that's just across all countries. How does the American roadworks compare to Sydney roadworks? Because from people that I've t- spoken to about Sydney traffic, I think I'm getting away with a lot of things living in Brisbane. Yeah, so Sydney traffic is absolutely awful, particularly for commuters. You have that usual rush hour at the start and end of the day. And for some reason, roadworks never seem to wrap up at those particular times like you wish they would compared to, I mean, there's so many places in the States, but where I was from in Philadelphia, they at least were able to make it a little bit more manageable, particularly during rush hour. They tried to do most of their work at night, so can't complain too much about that. Yeah, no, I got hit by the night ones here. I think they do them night works mainly so they don't have to work in the heat. But um, yeah, I, I dro- dropped my mum off from the airport and I drove back. It wasn't exactly pretty too much at night. It was maybe nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, but they were just starting to put all the cones out and slowing down to 40 k's an hour on the highway you just wish it was a bit faster i know it's safety we want to be safe no one wants to hurt anyone but 45 k's 50 maybe um does it really need to be the same as the school zone tell us a little bit about your life before you started to move to australia so i'm an american i lived in philadelphia for most of my life and had no intentions of moving to australia i was coming over here on holiday at the very end of 2019 and i was single i'm like why not go on tinder see if i can meet a few locals figure out the good places to go and ended up swiping right on my now aussie husband so here we are three years later after that swipe and I wouldn't change a thing, to be honest. What a fantastic <laughs> advert for Tinder. It really is. I mean, Tinder, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a few friends that have met and now married subsequently off of Tinder. I don't think they've ever swiped on anyone who was visiting on holiday necessarily. The internet, it's a fantastic thing. Yeah, you can meet so many people on there. I've had some amazing stories from Tinder and I've had some of the horror stories. So you meet a huge <laughs> variety of people on Tinder. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, mm, we won't go with the horror stories necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's maybe might, might not be safe for the intended audience. Um, you're living in Philly. What what did you do there? So I actually worked in the legal field over in the States. I was a senior paralegal, um, started off as a legal secretary, worked my IO up, but was in Philadelphia law for about eight years. Uh, moved over to Australia and completely pivoted. So I'm no longer in the legal field. I'm actually working in medicine and education. So very very different um but it kind of happened at the perfect time because my career over in the states had peaked and probably about five to ten years early and ended up moving over here and it gave me a chance to sort of hit that refresh button and look at what i wanted to do for the next five to ten years professionally do you enjoy it more doing that i like what i'm doing now the legal system over here is very confusing for me because it's so different from the american setup it's very similar to the british setup i know that but when it comes to things like parliament and mps and having a prime minister instead of a president it's a little bit intimidating so it's just a nice change for me to be able to go into like a medical slash education profession over here instead of just sticking with legal. Okay. I mean, I noticed as well, I mean, you say that it's similar to the British system and I I agree that it is, but there are, there are some sort of quite fundamental differences that I was 
a little bit shocked by. I mean, yeah, we have MPs, we have a, a not. I was about to say president. We have a prime minister in the UK. But what we don't have is we don't have this weird state system, which I would say is probably a little bit more like the US system in the sense that we don't have a, a state governor. We, we have counties with quaint little names. There's no one really in charge of them. Like they don't have their own say. So especially like when COVID happened and like the different states were like, nah, we're going to shut the borders. It's like, you can't do that. You're either all, all for one or nothing in England. <laughs> I mean, even the countries within them, they don't necessarily have their own governance and stuff. I know Scotland's trying to become its own own independent kind of country now, but no, 69, 68 million people, however many it is, they all do what they're told. And there's no none of this state stuff, which is weird because it, all of the legal bits are different. Like I, I'm a teacher in Queensland, but I can't necessarily teach in New South Wales until I, I pass some kind of, not exam, but... You know, I've got to fill in some forms. I've got to be registered there. It just makes it all separate. Yeah. I can't buy alcohol in Aldi in Queensland. That's the <laughs> that's the worst part of it. Like, it's okay. You've got the drive through bottle. Was... Do you not have them? You have, Surely you have them. I've only seen one. And now it might just be the location where I'm living, but I've only seen one drive through bottle since I moved over here. Meanwhile, there was like three or four in Philly where I live that were within maybe a 10 mile radius. I thought a drive through bottle was an Australian thing. I didn't even know that they had them in America. No. So funny enough, again, coming down to state laws, um, states over in America mandate all alcohol rules. They are the ones who govern and control it. So in Pennsylvania, it's actually very strict. Same as here. Yeah. So they have beer distributors, but you can't buy wine or spirits. There's a separate wine and spirits store you have to go to over in Pennsylvania. So if you're going to a party, you have two places you have to go to. Otherwise, you're driving over the bridge to Jersey to get everything in one spot. What? No wonder the carbon footprint of Americans is so high. They're having to drive between all the different bottles just to find what they want. Oh, shit. you wanted some some lollipop water? Then we can, oh, yeah, we'll have to go and get some. Can, does that work? Is that a thing? If you have to buy like a vodka cruiser, would you have to go to a separate one for yep. that? Oh, ridiculous. Yes. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> you said that you never really wanted to even, you, you never even thought about moving to Australia. What prompted even the holiday? So I was just initially planning some big holiday trip. I never really had the chance to travel solo. And I'm like, you know what? Let me save up all of my holiday time for the year over in the States and make one big trip somewhere. So I was going between Europe and Australia for a while. And I decided, you know what, let me go for Australia. Let me go to Perth. In fact, it's the farthest city in the world. I can sort of check that off of my bucket list and do a little three-week travel around Australia. So I did. I visited Perth, Melbourne, Hobart, and Sydney. So Awesome. Did, that's all. did manage to get to Queensland? I didn't. So I did. I initially had it planned. I was supposed to go to Brisbane, but then I met my now husband and he lives in sydney so like instead of me spending christmas alone in brisbane let me cancel that little part of my trip and spend the rest of the time in sydney and you know what it, it was worth it brisbane's a lovely place but you probably made the right decision there's always plenty of time to come to brisbane yeah now we can go up to brisbane together so <laughs> <laughs> you met your now husband i guess was that the the main reason for your move yeah, that was the main reason for me relocating. We were going back and forth for a little while and um, we knew that the relationship was serious, that it was going to basically be end game for us. So we sat down and had that really hard, like heart to heart conversation. And we tried to take the emotions out of it. Like, let's look at this logically. Let's write things down and figure out reasonably which would be the best for us. And when we put pen to paper and started really figuring things out, there was just an overwhelming pro list for me moving to Australia compared to him moving over to the States. And it didn't make sense for either of us to just pick a random like third place to move where we had no support system or no friends. So it ended up being me moving over here. Interestingly, what were some of his reasons for maybe moving to the States? So moving to the States, I have family and friends who I'm a little bit closer to, um, particularly family. He has a much smaller family than I do. I have a very big Catholic family on my mom's side. So all the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, and everybody lives within Philadelphia. And they had like the last five generations. Nobody would ever do what I did. Um, so it was very, very shocking when I told my family the news. Um, the most, the farthest anybody had ever lived was like 20 minutes away over in New Jersey, God forbid. So moving halfway around the world wow. to Australia was quite a shock for them. How did they take it? Oof, mixed reactions. Some people were very, very excited for us. We had been posting 
on social media regularly while we were long distance. So everybody knew about our relationship and because we were long distance for almost the entirety of COVID, they can sort of follow our relationship as it went along in Facebook coincidentally. So hang on a minute, hang on a minute. So, so you've gone on your holiday in 2019, you've met your new husband, Mm -hmm. you just did your three week holiday and went back and and the romance blossomed and you had all these plans to to come, come back and then you couldn't. Right. Because COVID. How did that work? Uh, How did you manage to do that? I think it's because we're both very, very stubborn to a point, but it was just bad timing for us. Like if we had that COVID crystal ball to predict what would happen, I never would have left in January 2020. But things really unfolded in a very bad way for us in that three months. Um, He was supposed to come over right around Valentine's Day because my cousin was getting married. So he was going to go over to the States for a week to do the whole meet my family and meet my friends thing. And the day before his flight, he got into a near fatal motorbike accident and was in the hospital for three weeks. And with my American vacation time or lack thereof, I wouldn't have been able to go over without completely losing my job. So we're like, we had a trip planned for Spain in May of 2020. We all know what happened by May of 2020. But we were like, we have something to look forward to. Let's just hold out. I can't go over there just right yet, but it's just a couple more months we could hold out. And then about three weeks later, Australia shut its borders and I was locked out. And because he was getting medical treatment, he was essentially locked in. Wow. I think everyone was locked in by that stage. We, the same thing kind of happened to us. We, we, we got our visa granted in the December, 2019, and then all the plans to move over in, in 2020. And I, I vividly remember about the February because we were planning in, in me first stage moving in April, watching all of the news reports unfold about this, this new virus that had come out of China. And we were just like, that's going to cock this up, isn't it? Don't let it cock it. And then, and then it got, got, it gets bigger and bigger and they start talking about cases in the UK. And I said to my boss at the time, I was like, they're going to shut the school. It's, it's going to happen. They're going to, and then the week later they shut the school. Then all the borders start shutting. And I'm like, Oh my God, what are we going to do? I can't imagine what that would have been like if, if you're separated. Oh, it was tough. It was very frustrating. Um, so sort of leading into the visas and the visa that we decided on, um, there was a few different partner visas and the one that we had initially decided to apply for was the prospective marriage visa, the subclass 300. And out of all the partner visas, it was the only one that wasn't granted a travel exemption. You actually weren't eligible for a travel exemption with the prospective marriage visa for about 18 months into the pandemic. So they changed the rules by September of 2021. And then I moved over December, 2021. So how, how did you propose or how were you proposed to? If it was, did you, did you have to come back to Australia? I'm so, I'm so interested. So the funny thing is you don't actually have to formally propose in order to apply for a prospective marriage visa. And technically my husband has never proposed to me. Like we just decided that we were going to get married and he had had plans, but because of his motorbike accident, he couldn't come over. That never happened. And we actually had a timeline. Once I moved over here, we have to get married by a certain date. But like, you know what, why spend all the money on a ring and a fancy proposal and whatnot? Let's save the money, put it towards a nice wedding. We actually went on a very nice honeymoon a couple months before the wedding, actually, in July. So we have a very backwards love story in that we went on our honeymoon say, and then got married. Everything sounds no back proposal. to front. Yeah, it is a bit, but yeah. it wouldn't change it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, f- I mean, you're doing nothing for women who want to get engaged first by saying <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to... Don't let her talk about this. I want a ring. Um, but nah, it, that that's a beautiful thing to to hear about. It's it's so interesting just to how it how different it can be. Like who says everything has to go exactly to plan? You, I've heard before that COVID will make or break a relationship, but it's just so different to hear how actually COVID has made a relationship in, in a, such a different way. That's yeah, a very interesting story. Loving the time of COVID, as my coworker kept calling it. So Absolutely. You should write a book. What visa are you actually on now then? So I applied for my 820 visa in November of 2022, and I'm currently on a bridging visa B, waiting for them to pick up and approve my application. Okay. So. And how how long are you on this bridging one? What, what, what are you allowed to do on the bridging visas? So these bridging visas give you pretty much full work rights. You have full work rights, full study rights. You're eligible for Medicare once you apply. You don't have to wait for the visa to be approved. 
So I recently applied for Medicare. I'm still waiting on the Medicare card to come in, but that'll be very exciting for me because I've never been on any sort of health system like this. Don't you don't you get a Medicare card like an electronic one straight away? Um, I don't think so. I've had a little bit. I swear, bit of, I got one straight away. I think it might be because it's reciprocal between the UK and Australia. Um, it takes a little bit more processing, maybe on their end for somebody who doesn't have it from a reciprocal country. I thought the reciprocal one was only in the event that like if you're over here and you're from the UK or one of the countries and you, know, you break your leg, like they'll fix you up. That It's that element of the reciprocal care. Yeah, no, I, I literally just applied for Medicare online and then you, there's an app on your phone and you don't even have to wait for the card. You just log your details then on the app. I can see it in your face. You're like, what? This this magical mm -hmm. app? Yeah. And because sometimes when I go to the doctor and they're like, oh, have you got your Medicare card? I haven't got my card on me. So I just show them the app, which is the digital card. Mm -hmm. And you can even use the digital card as a form of ID. So I got told when I went to do my driver's license, they were like, oh, have you got any ID? I was like, yeah, I've got my Medicare card. And I showed them the digital one. And the lady didn't even know the rules on on there, and that she was like, "No, sorry, it has to be the proper one." And I was like, mm, "Pretty sure it doesn't," but I like she was like, "No, it can't do it." So she sent me home, and I went back a few days later with the real card and queried it with the next lovely lady that was there. She was like, "No, I can I can take the the digital one." I was like, "Why do you need to tell this this other one? Where is she? I want to see her. I want to tell her off." She obviously wasn't working. You have had what sounds like a crazy migration journey what's been the biggest challenge other than you know fostering beautiful romances from the complete other side of the world what, what's been the biggest challenge so far uh, so there were some challenges getting over here and there's been some challenges over here adjusting so i actually moved over here with my two cats and if you're moving over to australia with pets you need a bare minimum of six months before you can actually move them over because you have to go through this test, you have to jump through a few hoops. So it actually took about, it was about a seven or eight month waiting period due to COVID in order to get our cats set up in quarantine over here. So I actually have my travel exemption and visa ready to go in September, but because they weren't able to go into quarantine until November, I actually had to wait until they were in quarantine and set up before I can move over. So that was a little bit wow. of a hassle. That was another three to four month wait. Did you organize that all yourself or because I know there's like pet relocation people that can help you out with that, right? Yeah, you absolutely can't do it by yourself. There's actually um, certain agents that work. I don't know if it's necessarily with the quarantine facility over here or the government. I'm not sure how it works on their end, but you actually can't do it entirely on your own. You can do a good portion of it on your own but you do need a professional to help you at least from america to australia and there's a few really good companies that are good for that they were fabulous um moving our cats over they kept me informed the whole time and once they go into quarantine it's kind of a no news is good news thing so if you don't hear anything your pets are doing fine how much did the whole thing cost you because i know that's a big consideration when you're wanting to move your furry family over yeah, for us it was about 11 to twelve thousand dollars australian to move two cats over it was quite a hefty price. There were quite a few jokes when I moved over here. Like, you know, there's cats here in Australia, right? They could have just picked two up from the pound here. You say that, like, that was, we had a dog and a cat in England and we um, denied about bringing them over as well. But our cat didn't travel particularly well. Like, our, our vets was maybe a mile away and he, he just freaked out even just for that short five minute journey. The dog probably would have been fine. She was a little bit younger, but it just sat with us that what what would how would we feel if one of them like the worst kind of thing happened like us selfishly trying to bring them over when we we, we they are now live with my wife's parents and they they're so happy there like they probably have a better life than they did with us and I, I know if i ever go well, if when i go back there and see my dog she'll be like who are you <laughs> these are my new parents now like, i don't even remember who you are so I know that they've got a better life. Had we not had that kind of support network where they could have gone, then obviously it would have been the case of, yeah, we, we need to think about what we can do here. But yeah, if you've got no one to live, leave them with and you really, really want to bring them, it's, it's nice to know that it's it can be done and it's it's handy. How are they adapting to the new Australian life and the weather? Oh, they love it now. I mean, it's a little bit warm for them some days more than others, but for the most part, they've adapted just fine. I think it probably took about a month total for them to completely adjust because there was a little bit of a time period where they were here and it was just my partner who they never met and they were now in this strange environment and suddenly the weather shifted. So it was a little bit of a shock for them maybe that first month. But once I moved over, maybe after a week after that, they've settled in just fine.
Can you imagine going through these cats' minds? Why is it warm and who's this bloke? What? what? <laughs> oh, I would love to know what they were thinking. <laughs> what are you expecting or what were you expecting your new life to be like in Australia? So I moved over to New South Wales when we were going through a La Nina summer and it was very, very rainy and it was surprisingly cool last summer as well. So you almost expect the stereotype of like bright sunny days and really warm weather and I come over and it's gray and cloudy and rainy and cold almost the entire summer last year. <laughs> so that was a huge yeah. shock. So pretty much because of the weather, we didn't really get to go out and do too much last summer as far as like beaches and barbecues and the typical Aussie outdoor summer activities. It was actually better in winter, I found. Yeah, it was a surprisingly mild winter, all things considered. Yeah, well, winters in Queensland are just, they're still hot. We just go from hot to hotter <laughs> and, and sweaty. Like this year, not too bad. I mean, I know they were saying it's still La Nina, but I definitely think it's kind of the end of the La Nina kind of cycle. But yeah, last year, we've never had a, considering we've kind of moved at a similar kind of time, maybe I said a little bit earlier, but we've never had a proper Aussie summer. And I don't know how I feel about that yet. It's always next summer, right? <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's a veranda over the barbecue. Even when it rains, we still have a barbecue. Don't let that stop us. Yeah, she'll be right. <laughs> My favorite saying, do it as well. What kind of plans do you have then for the future? Like with the whole moving, this this is your new life, right? Yeah. Like what, what do you want to do? Uh, so for us, it's kind of the whole Australian dream. We're saving up for a down payment on our first house. Kind of keep going back and forth as to where that first house is going to be. But it'll still where are you thinking it'll probably still end up being in new south wales but personally i would have loved to move somewhere just a little bit different even just for a few years particularly because housing prices around here even in the far western suburbs and around sydney have gotten so overblown how much uh, are you looking at having to to stump up them for your first house in sydney because like, even in brisbane mm -hmm. i know they've gone crazy since we bought so we've been looking even out here in the suburbs for a house that doesn't involve too much work in like an okay suburb not even like a really decent suburb easily be nine hundred thousand a million dollars how does that compare to the american house prices that you were kind of used to so it was definitely a sticker shock seeing how much the houses go, especially because when we started looking and talking about it, it was early 2020, mid 2020. So before the giant price jumps during COVID. So seeing them jump up from like $600,000 homes to almost million dollar homes within the span of two years was a huge shock for us. Compared mm -hmm. to prices in the States though, the prices in the States are still going up considerably as well. Not as drastically, but it's still... A big jump for sort of the nine hundred thousand million dollar house in Sydney. What's that getting you? Oh, that's getting you a three bedroom, one floor house all the way out in Western Sydney, like way even beyond Parramatta region. We're talking like three hundred square meters, four hundred, yeah, like four hundred ish. Yeah, probably about that. Okay, the big question now: What would that get you in Philly? Oof, gosh, if you have to do the conversion and whatnot, that would probably get you like. Probably a three or four bedroom home with like the attic and the basement in like a pretty decent neighborhood. Definitely not the richer neighborhoods, but it'd still be a pretty nice neighborhood, all things considered. Okay. So reasonably comparable then. I guess with you Americans loving your basements and stuff like that, you get, get all the extras. You wouldn't want to put anything in the attic here. It's just too hot. That's what storage is for. That's where you put the Christmas tree and whatnot. That's where you put the stuff you don't use most of the I time. We use a plastic one. I swear if I put a Christmas tree in my in my attic, it would melt. <laughs> it's so hot. I feel for the guys that redid our uh, ducted aircon. I mean, all I did every now and again was I'd pop my head up and say, do you want a drink? And even just my head would come back and pff, just covered in sweat. <laughs> oh man, crazy, <laughs> crazy. I mean, house prices for us, because we used to live just outside London and house prices were getting like, that's one of the main reasons why we wanted to move. Like we just thought we can't, this, this is it. Like we can't afford anything bigger. And I remember when we first came here, our rental property already was bigger than the house that we, we came from. I guess it, it really does depend where in the world you come from to what your perspective is about house prices in the different areas like don't get me wrong they're expensive in australia mm. in certain places for sure there are some places that are cheaper than others but if you, if you come from an area with already kind of cheap housing i think i think the biggest reason is because there's not enough they need to build more houses yeah. 
and they are. They're just not building them fast enough. Yeah, <laughs> can they? <laughs> Everywhere I look, they seem to be building more houses. <laughs> You've had a really interesting migration journey so far. Have you been sharing this? I mean, you said you were sharing it with with friends and family. Have you been sharing it outside of Facebook? I guess, like, I think people would be interested in moving to <laughs> Australia during a time of COVID, but getting married. Yeah, so I actually have my own YouTube channel. It's Caitlin Amanda. For some people who might be a little bit familiar with some of my older videos, I used to be known as kind of Australian, but then pivoted out of that. So you can find me on YouTube. I talk about what it's like as an American living in Australia, the differences between American and Australian culture. And I've started doing some reaction videos lately, so it's given me a chance to learn a little bit more about Aussie history. Yeah, that's the thing that we're finding the most is just trying to... English culture, British culture to Australia is reasonably similar. Like there's some just weird differences, you know, the fact that it's called lollies instead of sweets. That, that's one of the ones that gets me daily. Now, now I am using the word lollies. Just learning from a different perspective how how it must be from Australia. Like I guess anyone who, who is listening to this that is coming from Australia, america rather than the uk and you want to know how it's different like definitely go and check this channel out like it must be so weird what's the biggest cultural difference that you've experienced so far i mean the toughest part was probably the metric system we don't use it over in the states but it's used every single day over here so i remember like the first month especially pulling out my google like converter every single time i was trying to figure out something from american dollars to australian dollars and then it was like okay, now I need to figure out like just what temperature to turn my oven on. So what is it from Fahrenheit to Celsius and what's miles to kilometers? So all these conversions that you do within that first month that really catches you up. We, um, we have both in England. So we do things sometimes metric and sometimes imperial. We have pints, like that's what, 568 milliliters. We, we have everything in miles. Everything's in miles per hour, which is a bit weird when you go on the continent and everything's in kilometers per hour. There. Do you know what the one conversion is that I still can't get my head around? And I, again, I have to use my calculator when I do it. What do you have in America for like food? Do you have calories or kilojoules? Calories. Yeah, we have calories too. And everything here is in kilojoules. It's not even like, ah, oh, we'll do kilojoules and calories for it. No, nothing. <laughs> What what the hell is 2,000 kilojoules? Really, that's... I know it's 2,000 kilojoules, but what is it in calories? That's one of the easiest ones. You literally just take 25% of whatever it is. So if it's 2,000 kilojoules, it's 500 calories. Done. That's... You're blowing my that mind. Was the one... Is that it? That's it? That was the easiest one for me to learn, actually. No, I never even thought about it like that. Oh, my God. This is why I'm an English teacher, not a math teacher. <laughs> just divide it by four, Ross, you idiot. Like, come on. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't get that. Okay, now, now I'm going to be able to watch my weight. That, that's it. <laughs> You've unlocked the, the key to eternal slimness now. I wish. My gosh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Too many meat pies since I moved over here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So how many kilojoules are in a meat pie? What is your favorite meat pie then? Oh, so there is this little pie shop that my husband took me to once when we were coming back camping. Um, it's called Pie in the Sky, so they shorten it to pits. And they had the most amazing rosemary and lamb pie I have ever had. Like, shout out to pits. It was so so good rosemary and do you eat a lot of lamb in america no not at all it was a big shock moving over here was just how readily available lamb is in so many different forms i think there's more sheep than people i think that's like an easy statistic we, yeah we have a lot of lamb in england ironically do you know what a lot of our lamb in england comes from new zealand really yeah literally let's just cart it all the way across from the other side of the world <laughs> you yeah, know talking about carbon footprint it's quite refreshing actually to come to australia and seeing australian made on everything mm -hmm. like everything you know some obviously you still get some of the stuff from china and things like that my utes from china but it's just nice to know that if you want to go local, if you want to support local, it's a great thing. And then I suppose we throw a few bucks to the Kiwis way and you know, buy some of their lamb maybe sometimes. <laughs> What's surprised you the most about the whole moving process? I think what surprised me the most was I thought I would be a little bit like more prepared to adjust to life over here because I'd been in a long distance relationship for almost two years and I'd heard the slang words and I'd met um, my husband's Aussie friends and family. So coming over here, I thought, okay, this will be a little bit easier. And I think I underestimated just how long it would take me to fully adjust. Um, like I remember I was walking through Woolies about a month into moving over here and I just needed a can of condensed milk for a recipe and that's all I needed. So I'm walking around the entire shop. It's busy. It's absolutely packed. It was right before Australia Day slash Invasion Day. And it was just a madhouse in there. And I remember 
almost panicking because I could not find this can of condensed milk and actually started crying in the middle of a Woolies because I could not find this can. I'm like, I would know exactly where this is at if I was back in the States. So there's small little things that you don't realize can actually be very overwhelming. And I wish somebody had told me, like, just be patient with yourself the first six months, especially because it's a huge shock. I bet you cried as well when you saw the price of it. <laughs> I cried when I saw the price of lettuce six months ago. <laughs> How much were they charging for the lettuce? Uh, six fifty at the Woolies near me. Do you remember when it got up to like $12 yeah. during the floods? Oh, yeah. Just stop eating lettuces. <laughs> we haven't got any. Yeah. Who needs a lettuce for $12? I remember there was outrage because KFC moved to cabbage in their sandwiches because they couldn't keep up with the lettuce for me. <laughs> Why would you have a KFC? Just, just give me the chicken. Exactly. Now, who goes to KFC for the salad? Yeah. Don't make friends with salad. So before you moved, did, was there a lot of information about Americans in particular? Was there any help like for Americans moving to Australia? Is that is that the reason why you wanted to start the YouTube channel? Yeah, because most of the stuff that I saw was like on a fairly superficial level. It was either talking about Aussie slang words that you needed to know or they got really into visas in particular, which we already knew which visa I would be on and what the whole pathway was. So we had already had that laid out. I'm like, what is it like actually moving here and moving over here permanently, not just as a backpacker or as a student? What is it like actually moving over here, especially when one person has been born and raised in Australia? I mean, it's not like it's a couple moving over and this is something that you're doing together this is one person moving over and learning to adjust to a whole new culture in a whole new land and all everything that encompasses yeah. moving. do you know what i find most of the american style you well not style it's not an american style it's an american americans on youtube when they're making videos about australia it's all about yeah you're right the slang and why the animals are trying to kill you like have you had any animals trying to kill you so far I mean, not yet, but I'm surprised by the number of spiders I've seen since I moved over here. I gotta admit, being out in the West. What spiders Western have suburbs, you seen? Uh, so I've learned to make friends with huntsmen. I leave them alone. They scare me when I turn around and see a giant spider on the wall. But at this point, I've gotten to the point where I can just walk away and leave them alone. My husband catches them Your up best... with his bare hands. I can't. But... Oh, how does he do that? I mean, I, I tried to to shoot. I'm gonna say they use the word shoe in case there's any um, spider enthusiasts out there. Like I tried to shoe one away from me they're so quick they are they just and i was i was scared it's gonna like gonna jump in my face and, and eat me so that's it I, i'm the same with you like they don't do much i mean don't get me wrong i don't want to go tickling them and find out what it's like to have one bite you but i've been told they're not really venomous like them you don't want one to bite you but by the same token they're not out there trying to kill you right and they're actually very friendly um so funny enough we went camping about a month after i moved over here not even and my husband being like rugged outdoor ozzy grew up in the outdoors basically picked up a spider off of a log a huntsman spider that was about the size of my palm and was like okay come here we're going to make sure you get over your fear of spiders real quick so it puts it in my hand and i just have this little thing running back and forth so it got me over the fear of huntsman Mate. real quick but you know what they're very friendly they're very calm and they eat mozzies which makes me happy yeah that's what i've been told uh we get a lot of golden orbs in our garden and stuff the beautiful massive webs I mean, it's a bit of a pain when you walk in one and then you're scared. Oh, where's the poxy? Where is it? Where is it? Get rid of it. But yeah, they, they keep the bugs down. They keep the, the mozzies down and they stop you from having to do the old Australian salute all the time. So yeah, spiders, unless one bites you, they're your friend. Have you seen any snakes yet? No. And I'm very glad I don't have to. I have a friend of mine who works um, safety in the railways and she works somewhere out near the Blue Mountains and she's grown up in australia she's like oh well you just stand by the tracks and just kind of keep an eye for brown snakes and make sure that there's none around I'm like you say it's so calmly just keep an eye for one of the most deadliest snakes in the world like it's absolutely nothing yeah well you know i I, so I do joke about it but especially hearing how bad things are getting in england and stuff like that do you know what i'd rather take my chances with a brown snake that definitely doesn't really want to bite me unless it has to versus some of the the horror stories and things that keep popping up in the british media about just just everything all right i'll take it here we're, we're safe from that yes. I'll, I'll take a snake i'd rather have a weirdo with a knife well, rather wouldn't have a weirdo with a knife running around yeah, same here especially after seeing some of the news back home which uh we won't get into some american politics here let's keep it lighthearted. but i'd much rather yeah, be here religion and politics are the two things you don't talk about apparently do you have any regrets about the moving process so far so for me i have two things that I actually regret. One of them is when I moved over, I think I moved some of the wrong stuff over, to be honest. I sent everything over through Send My Bag because 
My husband obviously had a house full of furniture. We had all that set up. I just had to move my stuff over. And I brought over way too many clothes. I'm very much a girly girl, so I brought over a lot of clothes and didn't think that Australia has very different styles and fabrics. So the summer dresses that worked in Philly are very heavy and way too hot for summers in Australia. And a lot of my winter clothes don't really translate and are very, very warm for what's really like a spring day temperature wise. So I brought over way too many clothes and I wish I hadn't gotten rid of about half of my book collection coming over. So I was an English major, loved reading, absolute book nerd. And I went through and must have gotten rid of probably about 100 books, donated them, um, Salvation Army. And then after coming over here, I'm like, you know, I really wish I kept a little bit more of that. It would be nice to really fill up my bookshelves and all. So that's sort of the more superficial stuff moving over here. Yeah, I, I guess we, we did a similar thing. We used the Move Cube. And it's weird, the stuff that you, once you've moved it, you're like, Shh, I wish... I wish we'd moved that instead. Like, and you do. How how did you get rid of most of your stuff? We we ended up just putting it on Facebook Marketplace or donating it, and yeah, trying to recoup whatever money you can do. How did you get rid of your stuff? So for me, it was a very different story. I almost worked backwards. So I'd actually owned a house in the states. Ended up having to sell it and sold all of my furniture because I was moving into a furnished house with a couple of roommates. And then after I met my husband. I actually ended up moving back in with my parents temporarily because we had a great, great aunt living with us who was going through pretty moderate to severe dementia. So I was like, okay, let's have somebody else around the house to help her out. And that was the week that COVID happened. So I started working from make home. Make your own COVID bubble as well, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I pretty much gotten rid of all the furniture and all the big bulky items by the time I moved back in there anyway. So it really was just a bedroom's worth of stuff. That's the hard, I, I found that one of the hardest bits of moving here. It's just once everything's granted and you, you booked a flight, Oh God, I got to get rid of all my stuff now. And you know what the, the thing is that no one wants to do? You could just buy a skip bin and put it on the, on the drive outside. And, right, do you know what? Worst case scenario, I'm going to chuck it, but you don't want to do it. So you run through all of the hoops to try and, yeah. Just, do you know what the best thing is? Donate it. But again, we, we had that problem with everyone was, it was just after COVID. And even the, the charity shops were like, no, sorry, can you stop donating stuff, please? Because we've got too much stuff now. Wow. So we were just... Yeah, because everyone, had, it was it's the end of COVID or during COVID, and they were just thinking to themselves, do you know what? We don't need half of this stuff. Let's let's declutter. I think that, that lady off of um, Netflix was doing that thing of if it brings you joy, you know, if it doesn't bring you joy, get rid of it. So everyone's just like, you know, get rid of it. We're going to redecorate. All we can do is buy paint. That was one of the few, few shops we could go to. You can either go to the supermarket or you can go to, you know, like, well, what's the English equivalent of Bunnings? Like home base. There you go. You go to home base and just buy some paint. Paint's expensive here as well. Oh, it is. You should ship. You should ship paint. <laughs> I was shocked when the first time. Nah, seriously. When someone said to me, "Oh, here you go. Here's a a ten liter bucket of paint." You're doing your maths now. What's ten liters? Yeah. I think that's about like three and a, three and a, three and a bit. Well, your gallons are even different. To I'm ours, like, okay, so, you know what? That's yeah. five Coca Cola bottles. Let's line it up that way. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. the American in you. Yeah. But it was just like, oh yeah, ten liters of paint. What color do you want? Oh, that's a hundred dollars. It's a like, hundred dollars. Like you're crazy. We used to spend sixteen pounds on two liters of paint, so we we'd be spending, yeah, thirty quid. And they're like, oh, that's no, a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. What's the thing that you've price wise, other than housing, mm -hmm. what what prices shocked you the most compared to America? So, well, one of them being like just overall healthcare costs here. Um, so my health insurance is actually the, the, the other way though, like yeah. cheap. <laughs> I know that's surprising. Okay. So there's a benefit in there for any Americans listening. The healthcare cost is significantly cheaper, even on just private health insurance. My private health insurance here before I was on Medicare was actually half the cost of my private health insurance over in the States and it covered wow. a lot more. So it was a little bit cheaper here, but flip side, it's a little bit tough to say because I know we had that issue with the floods and produce and whatnot, but produce during winter here is astronomical and it might not be so much this winter it'll be interesting to see i think it was a big shock because of the floods and whatnot that were going on last year but seeing the price of produce and the price of meat around winter here was just an absolute sticker shock so one of the things that i've realized here because it's the same in england like if you want because they just import it right it just the price of things pretty much stays consistent all the way through the year. Yeah, you have, you know, strawberries when it's in the summer, obviously they'll come down a bit, but nothing ever really jumped up too high. And here it just kind of makes you think, do you know what? Oh, it's winter. You know, pumpkins are really cheap right now. Why don't we just make things out of pumpkins? Which is 
Yeah, it's, it's a great thing. It makes you a little bit more, more conscious about what your purchasing habits are. You know, we know why it's expensive because there's no freaking salads right now. Like it's it's winter. Yeah. Okay. So hmm, I've never really eaten this. Like it just forces you. It's probably, you're probably going to be a bit healthier as well, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, we just, oh, I've got to eat, I've got to eat a different vegetable. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. But when you, when you first come here and you're just like, it's that, I suppose, that entitled part of you, isn't it? You don't realize how entitled you are. Like, no, I will not pay that for, for mushrooms. It's, it's crazy. And then you're like, mm, maybe just eat something else then. Oh, okay. You get pretty creative with meals over here after a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You kind of, you end up at the end of it thinking, oh God, why was I so unreasonable? Let's just go and sit in the sunshine and have a beer, you know, yeah. <laughs> get over myself. <laughs> if you could do it all again, what would you change? I mean, it sounds like you've got a, a lovely, beautiful husband. You wouldn't change that. What What else would you change? Uh, if there was one thing I would change, it would have been checking with a migration agent before we filed for our visa. So I had applied on a prospective marriage visa, the subclass 300, which is actually Australia's most expensive visa. Um, and we had- How much was it? So I had applied back in 2020 and it was a little over 7,800, but there's a caveat to that. With that, you have to pay an additional fee once you apply for the 820. So for prospective marriage visas, you have to come to Australia. You can get married anywhere in the world, but you have to enter Australia. And then once you get married, you have to apply for the 820. And that was an extra 1350 to pay on top of it. So we're talking almost $9,000 for a visa. What is the cost of love in Australia? There you go. Mm-hmm. $9,000 if you do that route. It sounds like you've learned a, perhaps a slightly cheaper or an easier way. What do you think the visa agent would have told you? So we had registered our relationship um, about a month or two before we had applied for the prospective marriage visa so that would have technically made us eligible to apply for the 309 slash 301 offshore temporary slash permanent partner visa which wouldn't have had that extra 1350 fee which actually had much quicker processing times during covid Um, we were a little bit concerned about our evidence because we've been long distance for so long and technically we'd only been together for 11 days out of our entire relationship so we were a little bit concerned that if we put an application and even if we were technically eligible that we wouldn't get it so instead of going to a migration agent like we probably should have to double check with a professional we just took the safe route and applied for a prospective marriage visa which took almost a year to be granted and then obviously you have to get married over here it took me a little while to move over here so i applied in august 2020 it's now the beginning of 2023 and still waiting on the 820 and i have no idea when i'd ever get permanent residency if they'll do a dual grant or if i'm going to have to wait two years from applying for the 820 to apply for that so we'll see it could be a very long time i had a guest on here previously um who who made the comment that yes you can do the whole visa process on your own. Like it's not, he, he actually applied for two visas and one he used an agent. And then the second time, because they had used an agent, they felt a little bit more comfortable with the application for a different visa. They just got bogged down by the waiting times. And he made the comment that if you are perhaps like in the legal profession, or if you're used to that kind of terminology, then perhaps that, is something that you could do yourself but you were in the legal profession so did you did you ever have a look at the forms what what did you think when you're kind of looking at the wording for it the forms are actually very very similar um you're filling out almost the exact same type of information whether it's the 300 or the 309 there's just slight variations on the form itself and for me i i'm a paperwork person it was very easy for me to stay organized and keep track of everything that we needed but we had what they do is Um, It's called front loading, where you put your police check in, you do your medical check right away, you provide them with all of the evidence right away. So that way, once they see your application, everything's already there for them. They don't have to go back to you for more information. Then you have to supply the further information and it can really add more time on the waiting. Um, Mm -hmm. But the problem is, even if you front load, even if you have a ton of information and a ton of evidence to provide for them, that doesn't mean that they're going to pick up your application any sooner. So if you're offshore, yeah. it's these offshore visa processing offices that are the ones that are looking at your application. As an American, mine was picked up in Washington, D.C. and approved that way. So it took okay. um, almost a year. It was 
just over 11 months from the time I applied to the time that they actually picked up and approved my visa, despite having legal experience and knowing how to fill out these forms and doing everything correctly and keeping it organized. You just have no control over that when it comes so down to it, it. So it doesn't make it any any quicker. And I know, obviously, having used a visa agent, I, and I am not organized. I am the most disorganized person ever. I'm lazy. When do I have to submit this by? How long can I leave it? I found that using an agent obviously knew the expertise part of it but they were kind of oh can you send us this so i felt the best that i could do was i'd receive this email asking for this form that form sign this blah 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 and i'd just be okay right i need to do that right away like that's my job for now and then someone else's processing time is the reason why it's going to take however long it takes and it's very similar no matter what type of visa you have it's just going to take however long it takes them to pick it up so if, if anything a visa agent might make it quicker for, potentially for you because you know they're an expert and they're doing what they know how to do something they do all day every day for people's visas and in your case that that's that's i guess what you're paying for i mean even sometimes you're not paying for it that's that's they'll offer you know true, true blue migration they'll offer you a free visa assessment they'll tell you exactly what visas you are eligible for and if you had just kind of made that call um you know they'll tell you and it's no obligation so what can you lose so even if you think you know the visa that you're most eligible for always if you get the chance for a free consultation of anything it definitely doesn't hurt to call what 15 20 minutes of your time definitely double check that's one thing that i actually regret and wish that we had done because they might have said no, that that was the only visa option, but at least then we would have known and it wouldn't have been as well, what if. And you wouldn't have wasted your time and your money going any further. Yeah. What advice would you have for people wanting to make the move, especially, I suppose, making the move for love? So there's quite a few things if you're moving over on a partner visa. Obviously, for the visa itself, it's be organized. If you're even in the slightly serious stage, if you're even starting to hint at maybe one of you moving over, immediately start saving documents, start taking screenshots, start taking pictures together, post things online, because this is all stuff that the department is gonna to wanna to see if they're looking at a partner visa application. So we were lucky that we've, we've always been posting online. We post on social media constantly. We contact each other regularly. So we would take screenshots off of WhatsApp, either of our calls or of our messages. So just make sure that you're constantly taking screenshots to provide evidence later on down the line when you do actually apply because all of that is going to be crucial evidence for you later on as far as actually moving over once you move over as far as once you actually move over some of the biggest things you have to do is be patient and be supportive because so many people think that it's such a burden for the person moving over but you have to remember there's two people in a relationship when you're doing partner visas it's not just a huge move for the person who's moving over but for a lot of people moving over particularly on prospective marriage visas where you maybe never lived together or at least for an extended period of time, you're going through so many changes together. Even though you're with an Australian partner who's probably lived here for a considerable period of time, you're now living together. This is a huge part of your relationship. So you need to be patient with each other. You need to be kind. You need to be supportive. And remember that there's still a strain on the Aussie partner in this as well, not just the person who's moving over. So it really is a team effort. Even if it's one person moving over, you have to treat this like you guys are a team going against everything else with this. Yeah, I, I guess especially, I mean, I talk a lot to people who it's mainly one person that's kind of driving the whole moving to Australia, that whole idea. It's, it's been their dream. And just, I guess, the other person is is the tag along. Yeah, regardless of, of your move, if there's other people involved, you, you do have to treat it all together. And, and communication is that key. Absolutely. I mean, this is a huge move. It's a huge cost. It's a huge investment. So this is something where you need to be able to communicate and need to have those hard talks, not just the who's going to move where talk, but any hard talk and decision that a couple's going to have to do if they're having a serious relationship. It's a little bit pushed on you if you're going through a partner visa process a bit because you really have to force yourself to be open like you can't just necessarily move in together. And then if you guys break up, you guys just go your separate way and you live like 20 minutes within the same city. It's not like a regular relationship. You do really have to put it all out there from a very early stage in the relationship often as well. And what advice would you give to a slightly younger Caitlin who was just moving to Australia for the, for the holiday the first time? What advice would you give to that, Caitlin? If you're moving over for a holiday and whatnot, just have fun with it. 
enjoy your time over here. Try to meet as many people as you can, whether it's just for friendships, whether you're dating anybody, just get out there as much as possible because there's so much that Australia has to offer beyond just seeing the main sites in Sydney and in Melbourne. So if you're coming over on holiday, go out to some of the more isolated areas, go out to the Blue Mountains, go on a group tour if you want to do that, go bushwalking and go swimming on the beaches. Just try to experience as much as you can and soak it in. And I think a lot of people who come over here on holiday tend to fall in love with Australia, no matter what, whether they fall in love with an Aussie or not. <laughs> Do you wish you'd ever come out now in hindsight on a working holiday visa as a younger person? You know, there's always that what if, like if only I could have, if I had the opportunity to and a little bit of hindsight, I absolutely would have loved to. But I was always one of those people who never thought of going overseas even for more than a month. It was always something that other people did, people who were more adventurous and outdoorsy and extroverted. So I never considered myself somebody who would ever go overseas long term, let alone move overseas. So I would have loved to either study internationally over here or done a working holiday visa. I think working holiday visas are such a fabulous option for people who want to see Australia. If you're if you're thinking about it and you've got that inclination Hey, just just do it. What's the worst that can happen? You'll end up moving home. Exactly. Thanks, Caitlin, for sharing your journey with us all the way from America to Australia during a time of COVID. And if you want to see more of Caitlin, check out her YouTube channel at Caitlin Amanda. But if you want to see more of our life down under, then check out our own YouTube channel at That Johnston Life. And if you want to find out what your best options of moving to Australia are, then speak to our sponsors, True Blue Migration Services, on their website, www.truebluemigration.com. And I'll see you next time.